It's Bullseye. I'm Jesse Thorne. My next guest is Tabitha Soren. Tabitha started out her career as a reporter and a newscaster. She was with MTV News for a long time, back in the 80s and 90s. Now she's a photographer. She works mostly in fine art. Her latest project is one of her most ambitious. It's called Fantasy Life. For 15 years, Tabitha followed the draft class of the 2002 Oakland Athletics. Wherever their careers went, so did she. Only a couple of them went on to play Major League Baseball. A lot of them kind of languished in the minor league farm systems, getting traded every now and then. Some ended up coaching high school, taking other jobs. The pictures are fascinating to look at, kind of in the same way the movie Boyhood is, with a bunch of baseball players instead. She collected the photos in a book that was just released this past weekend. I'm really excited to have Tabitha here with me now. Tabitha Soren, welcome to Bullseye. Thanks for coming on the show. Thanks for having me. Uh, do you like baseball? <laughs> You really know where to start, don't you? <laughs> um, no, not particularly. I don't hate it, but I I have so much of it in my life that I uh, I it's hard to get excited about it. My nothing really compares to watching my son play little league games. So it's really hard when I go to a major league game to feel the same sort of emotion as when you're watching your own child play. They have more beer at Major League Games. Uh, that they do. I, <laughs> I just wish I could hang with those people who start drinking at 11 a.m. I really do. I've never been that person. I would fall asleep by the end of the game. I've never been a drinker, and as I've become an adult, I've realized how deeply connected being a baseball fan and drinking beer continuously for four hours are for everyone else who likes baseball. <laughs> Right. Well, maybe that's the key. Maybe that's the secret ingredient that I'm missing. So how did you come to baseball then as a subject? My husband wrote a book called Moneyball, and he developed this very nice relationship with Billy Bean. They became BFFs, and Billy Bean's the manager of the Oakland A's. And so they dragged me to spring training in 2003. And I brought my camera equipment along because I was starting to head in the direction of being a serious photographer. I hate to use the word fine art, but I wasn't, I wasn't pursuing documentary work. I was trying to make pictures that hadn't been seen before, and Arizona has really great light, so I had all the equipment with me. And uh, when I met this group of guys, I, I just felt like I had fallen into a subculture that I knew nothing about, and they were as interesting to me as, you know, subway kids or... I don't know, other sort of more rock and roll, edgy subcultures. Because I'm not very athletic or sporty, I found them very compelling. The other thing that was very compelling about meeting a whole group of people about to start off on a journey was that they were full of purpose and full of hope and Ignorantly, I thought I was surrounded by the winners. These people had left their junior year of college to be part of a professional baseball team. And I thought, oh, my goodness, you know, it's only a matter of time till they get to the major league team. And I didn't realize that only 6% of them were going to get there. To what extent did the guys that you met in 2003, in 2003, recognize the length of the odds that they faced? I don't think any of them did. I don't think any of them wanted to think about the length of the odds that they faced. And if you do think about it, I don't think you will make it. I feel like you have to believe in the idea that you might touch greatness. And if it happened to Derek Jeter, why wouldn't it happen to you? Or why couldn't it happen to you? I feel like that had to be the mental state for all of them. Certainly there were people who were more confident than others, like Nick Swisher got a huge signing bonus. His dad was a major league player. He completely relates to, you know, I mean, the, from the second he ended up on the spring training in 2003, they called him Big League Swish. So um, there are people that seem destined to be there. But an injury could get in the way of that as well. I mean, the amount of chance... Uh, in this game or in any professional sport is enormous. And my artwork is very much about chance. There were two sculpture installations when you presented the works in this book in galleries. And one of them was a tower of peanuts. Can you tell me about that? Yes. I, 
I piled thousands and thousands of peanuts into a rectangular box, a plastic box, and it was, I think, about six feet tall. And the top 10% I painted bright, bright gold to represent the people who actually made it to the major leagues and all the little peanuts underneath were all the people who were drafted. The funnel in baseball is purposefully wide because they know that it's a mysterious game. They know the opportunity for an injury or a shoulder surgery to end a career. And they know actually that college pitcher or college coaches often over pitch their pitchers. And a lot of the pitchers at the end of their college season show up at spring training hurt. So that was one of that was one of the um, very uplifting and optimistic pieces of art in my show that people could stand there and at eye level see that there's only a sliver of gold peanuts in the statue. And the other sculpture that I had was a bunch of body bone parts. I wouldn't say body parts. So uh, one of my players had shoulder surgery and they took out a bunch of bone spurs at the same time. The doctor gave him the bone spurs after the surgery, and he didn't know what to do with them, and his wife didn't want them. So they said, you know, maybe Tabitha will have some use for them, because at this point, anything <laughs> strange— His wife didn't want them. Like, like, he gave them to her for Valentine's Day, and she's like, can I well, just get a box of chocolates? I mean, she wasn't sentimental about them. She didn't—I guess what I should say is she didn't mind him giving them to me. So I thought, well, I'll photograph them. Maybe they'll be cool-looking. And they just looked small and kind of yellow, and they weren't that interesting, and— but then a lot of my players had surgeries over the years, and a lot of them have bone spurs because the repetitive motion of baseball um, causes calcium deposits. So I just collected as many as I possibly could until they changed the law that they were no longer allowed to give body parts to <laughs> the subjects. And then um, to collect more, I went to dentists and oral surgeons and, and eventually had enough small little chips of bone that I could make a constellation of stars. I felt like the bone chips represented the sacrifice that the players give to this game, to this passion. Really, to me, it's not about the games that they play or not the sacrifice that they're making for baseball. It's the feeling that in America, we are all striving this incredible amount to do something extraordinary and anything less feels lazy and like you were selling yourself short. And we've normalized that kind of passion and that striving for greatness um, to the point where it, we have physical examples of it not being good for your body and we're doing it anyway. There's this pitcher for the Giants, the San Francisco Giants, named Matt Kane, who was a, a superstar pitcher and signed a huge contract and got hurt and has never been the same since. And I heard the Giants color announcer, Mike Kruko, who's a former pitcher himself, talking about this the other day. And there's been four years that he's really struggled and has been on the team substantially because of what he once was. And Kruko told this story that essentially what happened is during his best years, his arm was so mangled that he couldn't even straighten it. He couldn't hold it straight out in front of himself um, because of bone chips in his elbow. And he was pitching through incredible pain the entire time. And finally, it got to be with bone chips, they can move around, you know, and sometimes they get to the point where you literally can't use your limb because of the pain. Oh, my gosh. And so he had surgery to remove the bone chips. And they removed the bone chips. And since he had the bone chips removed, his arm changed completely, essentially. He was, for the first time since, you know, college, high school age, he was able to use his arm fully. But because of that, he was never able to reproduce his pitching motion. Or and his so speed. Yeah, and so he's been struggling to be a consistent and effective pitcher ever since simply because he can use his arm. <laughs> and I'm, not, I'm not surprised by that story. I have a player on in my group named Ben Fritz, and he showed up from college 
at, at his first spring training hurt, and he's had a couple of surgeries, and he wasn't able to get the speed back uh, that he had during college until he was about 30. And so um, I think it might have been the Giants. The Giants had him for spring training one year, and then the next year another team invited him to spring training because his numbers were the as good as they had ever been. But at that point, um, they're not going to actually use one of their picks on the 40-man to sign someone who's 30 years old or 32 years old. One of the managers told me at the very beginning, he said, yeah, you know, when we get them, they're all like melting ice cubes. So we get this like pristine, perfect specimen, and it's just all downhill from there. So um, I, I know exactly what you're talking about. And I think that in general, this project for me is about how unlikely events can happen at any time and change our course. And yet, you know, more generally, most of the time, my players found a certain resilience. They had to reintegrate their idea of themselves and sort of figure out, okay, if I look in the mirror and I'm not a baseball player, who am I then? And I think Americans are actually very good at that. When there's tragedy involved, we go on. It it amazes me what people survive. When these guys got to the inflection point in their career where they had to consider the fact, where circumstances dictated that they consider the fact that they might not be the special one, how did they deal with adjusting their lives from a quest for being the best of the best to getting satisfaction out of being normal? So a couple of the people who were frustrated with their station in baseball decided to quit. And then some of them also decided to quit their family life at that point, too, and they got divorced. Some people had a different response. They were single. They were going to get out of baseball. They didn't have that in their repertoire anymore. They were rebuilding their identity, and they got married because they wanted some— I mean, there are a lot of reasons to get married, but I feel like one of the reasons was they wanted some family and stability that they didn't have for so long when you're in uh, the minor leagues. You know, I feel like some of them were a lot better than others at, at working through the feelings of not turning out to be Derek Jeter. There were people in my draft class who I asked to write an essay for this book who said to me, I haven't dealt with any of these feelings, so writing this was incredibly cathartic. Or another guy said, you know, I cried writing most of this. And this is, you know, six or seven years out from the game. A lot of them retire go back and get their college degree because the major major league baseball pays for them to finish school and then they're off in a new trajectory one's an insurance salesman one's a money manager and and it's not until they have children and that child is playing little league that the feelings come up so one player Stephen Obenchain who's a money maker money manager he also makes money in Chicago has five children and when his son started playing little league he said it was really hard for him because um, he hadn't really watched games or gone to games. He hadn't even watched them on TV since he was released. And he was one of these people, I think he got a very big signing bonus, but then he got hit in the head with a ball and was never the same after that. So anyway, when his son started playing baseball, he decided he would force himself to coach. And once he saw the little kids show their childhood love of the game. It rekindled that feeling in him. It was no longer a professional, striving pursuit of a career. It was learning how to throw and catch and work as a team. But his essay in the book is so poignant. He says something along the lines of, um, there will come a time where my son's heart will be broken by baseball as well. And, you know, he'll either be too old, not good enough. Ugh, I wish I could read it to you. I don't have it in front of me. But um, I probably wasn't going to do it just as paraphrasing it anyway. To read these essays that these players wrote and actually have them 
explain their feelings and make themselves vulnerable. It was a revelation. I've never heard athletes talk like this. And maybe it's because nobody talks to athletes after they're done with the game. I mean, unless you're Derek Jeter. So I'm happy to give them a little bit of a voice in, in an art photo book as, as niche as, as that is. I, I've seen a lot of sports photography. I went to a I went to a great sports photography exhibit in, in the Brooklyn Museum last mm. year. You know, the things that are often celebrated in sports photography are the kind of beauty and majesty of athletic achievement, which really is remarkable. I mean, to see the muscles move in, a, in an Olympic runner is a beautiful and amazing thing. To see the vast expanse of green grass in the outfield of a major league baseball stadium with the you know with the crisscrosses mowed into it that's an amazing and beautiful thing to see capturing that drama and beauty of sport as it's being played is very different from the kinds of things that you wanted to capture in this story about these people well i i just think that I started out with a lot of those pictures in my head, too. But as an artist, I feel like there was no reason for me to add to that archive. I've seen those pictures. They're fantastic. They take a very particular skill set that I didn't actually really have. And I wanted to take pictures that hadn't been seen before and tell a new story about the effort to touch greatness. At the very beginning... There are pictures that don't look like other people's pictures because I wasn't very interested in the game. If I was in the dugout with Nick Swisher and the Cleveland Indians and they were spitting stuff onto the ground constantly, I was like, okay, well, no, okay, they're not sunflower seeds. What are they spitting down there? What? Oh, it's a big pink blob. Okay. Oh, it's double bubble. Oh, wait, there's brown stuff coming out of the double bubble. What's that? Tobacco. They put tobacco inside of bubble gum and chew on it? That's disgusting. Wait, why is the floor wet? Did somebody spill something? It's really hot and dry outside. Oh, that's not water. Oh, that's all spit. Ugh. So there could be a double play going on right outside on the field, but I'm thinking about the combination of the blue liquid with the pink bubble gum and then the brown scratchy tobacco leaves sticking out of it and and then I noticed oh the one Nick just spit out you can see his bite marks in the gum still so if I was a fan I would have been distracted by the home run the fly ball you know all of the exciting stuff that's happening on the field it took me a you know there's this picture of bubble gum with tobacco inside on the floor of a dugout and it's one of my favorite pictures because when you blow that up to you know four by six feet, the scale of it um, says a lot about sort of ugly beauty. And I wouldn't have been able to notice that picture if I had been distracted by a home run. Tabitha, you were a famous person when you were very young. Not an extraordinarily <laughs> famous person, but that's a famous right. Person. I was I was like a nice B list. Did you ever feel like you could recognize? any of the pressures that the baseball players were feeling from your own experience? I would say that during the process of shooting this project, I was not thinking of parallels between me and the players. And it was only after um, I was formulating the exhibit in 2015 in Los Angeles did I realize that we were both, the draft class and myself, launching second acts. Really? Yeah. I I think, you know, through this 15 years of working on this project, analog photography has gone into digital photography. And so, I mean, I taught myself how to do this. So this entire time that I am shooting these people struggling. I am struggling to get the exposure right, to take a picture that hasn't been taken already, to figure out which equipment I need, what do I need to pack. It's all a learning experience for me, too. I'm I'm figuring it out as I go along. And so there wasn't a lot of time for navel-gazing. There wasn't a lot of time for me thinking about what this said about me. 
Um, I was also having children. I was thinking about the pictures, photography, art, and the players. And only at the end of it, when people start asking me questions about the project, when I'm showing it to people, did I see a parallel to me launching into a new area just as they are. Have you yourself become comfortable in your life with being a relatively normal person? I mean, certainly being an artist isn't all that normal, but it's more normal than uh, being on my television when I was sitting at home from middle school. (laughs) (laughs) I don't know if I could say that I am completely comfortable in my own skin. I mean, my work is is about uh, psychological states. The running project is about the fight or flight response. The oceanscapes are about panic attacks. I think that you get a little window into my psyche by looking at the work that I do. Um, If I was completely comfortable, I don't think I'd be making great art. I think you have to have a little bit of the darkness in you. I think it also makes you work really hard. So I think that I am happy where I am, but I still am striving. And uh, I think that the art world is so arbitrary that you can't calculate too much. So there's no, there's no linear path, especially for women. Uh, the other reason I think I probably am not completely satisfied is because my husband, who lives in the house, is very much... Uh, somebody who seems to be doing victory lap after victory lap and his success is so public and he's such a great storyteller and explainer of complicated things and he deserves all the success he has as far as I'm concerned but some days I would I would be lying to you if I felt like some days I didn't feel invisible a couple weeks ago we went to a fancy party And I saw a man who will remain nameless but is associated with HBO take his place card and move it away from me and put it next to Michael and put somebody else next, some random person next to me so he wouldn't have to sit next to me. (laughs) I was just like, have you no manners? You know, I can see you. So there are any time I'm starting to feel like accomplished or really creative and fascinating, something like that (laughs) happens to make me, to remind me that the world doesn't care that much about artists and they certainly, and they care even less about artists who are mothers and wives. Well, you can tell your husband the next time he's feeling important that I'm still mad at him for convincing all the other baseball teams to copy the A's so now the A's don't have a secret advantage anymore. Yeah, you're not as mad at him as the A's are. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. Like, like, cat out of the bag. (laughs) (laughs) If he wasn't so darn good at explaining things. Well, I mean, I think the the problem there is that Billy let him see it all. But, yeah, I mean, everybody copied that trick, and there'll be some new trick soon. Well, Tabitha Soren, thank you so much for coming on Bullseye. It was really great to get to talk to you. I feel the same way about you. Tabitha Soren's new book is called Fantasy Life. It's a beautiful photography book of the 2002 draft class of the Oakland Athletics as they went through the following 15 years or so of their lives. It also features their reminiscences and memories of their careers and a a five-part short story by the author Dave Eggers about baseball as well. Thanks, Tabitha. Thank you, Jesse.